Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a wild week in trade, and it ain't over yet. Plus, can you believe football's just about here? In honor of the occasion at Mississippi State, they're beefing up the Bulldogs. In Southern Gardening, Gary's going nuts over Rubekia. And in our feature segment, if you can't lead the horse to water, sometimes you gotta take the water to the horse. We'll explain. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. It has been a wild several days in the world of global trade with no end in sight. The president acknowledged the trade war might cause further economic pain and then ordered all U.S. companies to find an alternative to China. That news continues to put pressure on Wall Street. Meanwhile, the president attended the G7 meeting in France. We look back as preparations were underway. As France prepares for the members of the G7 and their protesters, a country not part of the contingent threw a wrench into the global financial machine. In response to recent threats by President Trump, the Chinese government will impose $75 billion in highly targeted tariffs. On September 1, if the U.S. duties are imposed, China will add 5 percent to the price of imported U.S. soybeans and another 10 percent to U.S. beef and pork. On December 15, another 10 percent would be applied to U.S. wheat, corn and sorghum. Trump retaliated via tweet Friday he would raise tariffs on already taxed $250 billion worth of goods to 30 percent on October 1. As the crops in the fields in question mature, the White House faced another set of problems. At least two White House meetings focused on the backlash from last week's reports of another round of small refinery exemptions. The president and CEO of the Renewable Fuels Association, Jeff Cooper, sent a tart tongue letter to the EPA saying in part, Such a crass statement is entirely at odds with the facts and demonstrates a woeful lack of understanding about the actual marketplace implications of EPA's decision to approve SRE petitions. The RFA went on to add 2018 domestic ethanol consumption fell from 2017 levels the first decline year over year in 20 years. And ethanol's blend rate fell for the first time ever in the same time period. Battle lines are being drawn between renewable fuel and oil industry states. Letters from elected officials on both sides of the aisle were sent to the EPA laying out reasons to support their point of view. North America's building trades unions wants the EPA to stay the course, citing RIN prices dropping from 90 cents in November of 2017 to 11 cents in recent days has allowed for some refineries to stay in operation and keep union employees on the job. The president of the NABTU urged the Trump administration to continue lowering RFS requirements, which they believe would help the president protect every manufacturing job. Before gaining the party's nomination, Donald Trump campaigned on the issue of biofuels, as well as making campaign trail promises as far back as January of 2016. The RFS, which is Renewable Fuel Standard, is an important tool in the mission to achieve energy independence for the United States. I will do all that is in my power as president to achieve that goal. Following his election, no less than two events in Iowa alone were held on expanding E15. Those on the campaign trail seeking their party's nomination saw an opportunity to present their ideas on the topic this week. The, the, those waivers are a gigantic mistake. We should not be exempting, we should be insisting that these major oil companies, in fact, meet the criteria that is set. Um, the waiver process has been absolutely abused by President Trump, both the, the letter and the spirit of, of that law. Meanwhile, it appears that the U.S. and Japan have struck a trade deal, at least in principle. The news hit during the G7 weekend, and the deal is expected to be signed sometime in September. 
The president tweeted the news saying this, big trade deal just agreed to with Prime Minister Abe of Japan. Will be great for our farmers, ranchers and more. Really big corn purchase. Trade rep Robert Lighthizer spoke to reporters about the deal moments after it was announced. First of all, what we have is a, an agreement on core principles. It has three parts, agriculture, um, industrial tariffs, and digital trade. And from our point of view, it is extremely important for our farmers and ranchers and those people who work in the digital space. We'll get into the details at another time, but generally, Japan is our third largest agricultural market. They import about $14 billion worth of U.S. agricultural products. And this will open up markets to over $7 billion of, of those products. On the lighter side, hard to believe that football is just about here again. Players do need to beef up for the season. But at Mississippi State recently, they took that mandate to a whole new level, going from beasting to milking the experience for all it's worth. Farm Week's Amy Myers explains. So, like, you really got to pull. Like, you can't be gentle. You really got to, like, work it. So, like, it's, it's really challenging sometimes. Who would have thought Willie Gay, one of Mississippi State's leading linebackers, can school us on cow milking? Willie Gay and multi-talented offensive lineman Stuart Reese faced off for some friendly competition at the annual Beefing Up the Bulldogs. Oh, well, I almost got it pretty full pretty quick, but uh, the uh, cow kicked my arm, so a lot of it fell out, but it was pretty fun. Along with fun farm activities, the team enjoyed a healthy steak dinner provided by Mississippi Cattlemen's Association. It's just a way to remind them about the vitamins, the iron, the zinc that their muscles need, uh, the fullness that beef provides to them so they're not filling up on carbs or some, some junk food, and, and just nice the protein that helps build their muscles. Agriculture is the state's most economically important industry. And although Mississippi State University offers endless opportunities like in engineering, architecture, science, and business, MSU is most deeply rooted in ag education. So what better way to kick off college football than to celebrate that history? I think it's real good that we celebrate it because I think it's good to get the knowledge out to people of how food is prepared and you know how it gets from you know the animals to your table. Going into my junior year, I wish I knew more about it than I do. So I feel like it's very important to know like where you get your food, your milk from, and all that kind of good stuff. Do you think that later on you and your buddies are going to go and brag about who won the milking contest? <laughs> I don't think they'll brag about it. I think they'll just keep talking about the fact I drunk raw milk. <laughs> <laughs> this one should be fun too. Some people call them black-eyed Susans, others call them by their sunflower name, Rebecca. Whatever you call them, they're tough flowers, perfect for late summer. Here's Gary Bachman with his typically enthusiastic approach to brightening the landscape. Rebecca, our big, round, colorful flowers that work great in any garden. Let's take a look at a few of my favorite selections. Rubecchia are wonderful and produce lots of flowers in colors ranging from golden yellow to mahogany brown, having dark center cones. They're also called Gloriosa daisies, and man, do they live up to this name. Cappuccino produces flowers up to four inches across with dark orangey petals with a brownish red center accent splotch. Cherry Brandy has deep maroon red flowers with a dark chocolate center cone that are welcome in any garden. The flowers can be up to three inches across. Indian Summer was an All-America selection winner in 1995 and a Mississippi Medallion winner in 1999. This is a 36 inch tall selection that produces golden yellow flowers that can be six inches in diameter or greater. The flowers of Cherokee Sunset contain a blend of sunset colors, yellow, orange, bronze, mahogany, and all the shades in between. The up to four inch flowers are double or semi-double. And Prairie Sun is robust with distinctive up to five inch flowers. This three foot tall selection has a light green center cone 
surrounded by bright golden yellow petals having yellow primrose tips. These and all Rubecchia will produce the best flowers and colors when grown in at least six hours of full sun each day. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. In case you were wondering, Rebecca was named after Swedish botanist Olaf Rudbeck in the late 1600s. He was actually better known for his contributions in anatomy and linguistics. The flower name is honorary. Time for the markets. Here's what's making news this week. First, analyst Dan Huber has his thoughts about those USDA numbers some found hard to believe. Next, Josh Maples gives us a little preview on a story about the leather industry. And have we hit a new low in corn? Dan Huber has some thoughts on that too. Some folks feel that after a tumultuous year in agriculture so far, we may be finally getting around to numbers that are a little more accurate. Some of that comes after the Midwest crop tour, though even that was eclipsed by Chinese tariff concerns and the president's order to find other markets to sell to. Analyst Dan Huber has more. Granted, any crop tour is, again, is, is an estimate. Uh, I, I do think it probably would have had a little more impact had there not been some of this other news and, of course, you know, round two, round three, whatever it is of the uh, the trade tariff terrors that uh, hit us once again. But, but, but yeah, I, I think it was a verification for a lot of people in the trade that those USDA numbers that were issued here earlier this month are just uh, not even in, in the ballpark as far as what what reality looks like. So, you know, as we move out into August and, uh, you know, maybe, of course, I start feeling a few cooler temperatures and maybe a little more realization that, you know, we've got a lot of crop out there that uh, is probably at risk yet. And, uh, you know, the, the numbers that we have factored into the price are probably not realistic, or at least in my opinion, not realistic, that uh, it, it should start supporting us. And, you know, getting past this period of uh, just constant bad news throwing at the market, I think, is going to be enough to, uh, you know, just say we'll look back a month or two months from now and say, geez, that was just kind of a kind of a ridiculous period. We probably never should have been there, but hence that's how markets trade sometimes. Time now for today's trivia quiz. The Farmer's Almanac predicts a wild winter ride, saying, quote, this winter will be filled with so many ups and downs on the thermometer, it may remind you of a polar coaster. The Almanac has been around a long time and claims to be 85% accurate when it comes to weather. So, today's question is, when was the Farmer's Almanac first published? Is the answer A, 1818, B, 1865, C, 1918, or D, 1929? We'll have the answer coming up. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, Mr. and Mrs. Smith go to Washington. It was the middle of the August recess, a farmer's market of a different sort as ag producers took their message direct to Capitol Hill. There, the outcome had less to do with making a profit and more to do with teaching leaders on both sides of the aisle more about the realities of modern day agriculture. Congress gets an inside look. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, the always popular Mississippi Gourd Festival, Friday and Saturday, September 20th and 21st at the Smith County Ag Complex in Raleigh, Mississippi. This two-day festival includes several gourd crafting classes and artists from around the country will be there too. Cost is $2, parking is free. For more information, call Mike Thompson at 601-374-0245. Next, it's Breakfast on the Farm, October 17th through 19th from 9 to noon at the Bearden Dairy Center at MSU in Starkville. Learn where your food comes from, milk a cow, tour the dairy. The first two days are for school field trips. The 19th, that's a Saturday, is open to the public. Registration opens soon this fall. For more info, call Amanda Stone at 662-769-9941. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot.
It's interesting, beef demand is up, but the demand for leather is down. Beef apparently is definitely what's for dinner, but all those hides from the herd are turning to bovine blight. Here's ag economist Josh Maples with more in preparation for a story we'll bring you on the leather industry two weeks from now. Yes, we are eating more beef. You know, the beef consumption in 2019 is going to be of the highest uh, for the decade. A lot of that's supply related. You know, we're on the up side of a cycle. Uh, but if you look at 2019 numbers in a historical sense, it's really not that high. It, it, would, it wouldn't be high compared to the previous decade or the decade before that. Uh, so we're, we're not at record all-time high uh, of cattle production. It's just, you know, of the past 10 years or so in terms of actual numbers, uh, numbers of actual cattle processed. So yes, cattle, cattle processing is up. The number of hides produced is up. Uh, but this is a demand story just as much as it is a supply, probably even more so a demand story. And when you talk about demand for, for hides, you're talking about China. Over half of the hides that the U.S. produces goes to China. That's the biggest, mm -hmm. um, biggest country in terms of producing hides and processing hides. And demand has been weak there, and this has been going on for the past five years or so, uh, that you're, you're looking at... Uh, Competition from alternative leather alternatives has has, has really ramped up, and, uh, and so that's affecting the, the demand for these, especially lower quality hides. And unfortunately, that's leading to some of those hides really not having a market. And mm -hmm. and so really, it, it's two sides of the story. Yes, supply is up a little bit, uh, and and that's a piece of it. But also, demand has been weaker, and the trade war with China hasn't helped. You know, tariffs have hit the hide markets too. Uh, but really underneath is those demand, the, the demand for hides uh, in China is, is a lot weaker than it has been, and that's what's driving this market. In corn, the market's been hoping for a bump, but a bearish report on the 12th had the opposite effect. The result, December corn dropped 50 cents a bushel. Needless to say, it's been an uphill battle in the Corn Belt this year. Is the market probing for a new bottom? Here's Dan Huber with his thoughts. I think we're down testing lows, uh, you know, and not that there is a great justification why we would need to go to new lows, but, you know, sometimes you do it just because you can. You want to see, you know, in essence, test the water out, see what's left down there. But I, I really think we have reached a point in uh, beyond value. I mean, I think the value investors have already looked at this and said enough is enough. Uh, it's just a question mark of when do we start stimulating some buying from uh, bottom pickers, uh, maybe the shorts that you just you know kind of recognize that uh, with the amount of group risk we have out there yet, I, I think I, we estimated that uh, there's somewhere around 8 million acres of corn that was planted after June 1, I mean, which really says we've got a tremendous amount of acreage out there that is at risk for even a normal frost, let alone an early frost. So, uh, you know, like I say, I think once we get the calendar to roll over into August, those things will probably, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I should stipulate, as long as we're not hit with some other kind of a external, uh, a new trade war, a new threat here or there, you know, those factors, I think, will start to come back into the play in the minds of traders and uh, start providing value back into the prices once again. Back to the trivia quiz. You may have heard that some are worried about an early frost this year. Their concerns may have come from the Farmer's Almanac, which predicts a polar coaster winter ride. Today's question was, when was the Farmer's Almanac first published? Here are the choices. The Almanac has been around for 201 years and claims to be 85% accurate on its predictions. If you picked 1818, you are correct. A is the correct answer. Throughout the trade war and with all of the political discussion around agriculture lately, one thing farmers often say is that some of the folks in Washington could stand to learn a thing or two about farming and ranching. So with that in mind, a special farmers market was set up during the August recess to allow producers to take their message direct to Capitol Hill. According to the American Farm Bureau Federation, the typical American consumer is at least three generations removed from the farm. To close the gap, farmers and ranchers have found it all the more vital for rural Americans to share their story. During the Farm Credit Service's annual fly-in event, held just a few short weeks ago in Washington, D.C., Producers who use the financial institution's lending services were able to try their hand at engaging folks from both sides of the aisle about their farms and retail products. Probably the most important thing we're going to try to do is educate people about agriculture. Because if you look at Congress today, 
Very few of them have a direct tie to agriculture. They don't understand the modern realities. A lot of them are supportive of agriculture. They have this good feeling about farmers, but they don't know what the reality of modern agriculture is. And so job one up there for us is explain that. The third annual event was hosted in the Library of Congress. More than 80 farmers and ranchers brought everything from pecans to maple syrup to put on display in hopes of spurring a little conversation. One of the things we try to stress is agriculture is not the same everywhere. And some of it's big and some of it's small and some of it's commodities and some of it's really specialty products. And if you embrace all of that, you're gonna to start to understand agriculture as it exists in the world today. And you get a much clearer picture on what it takes to be successful out there. And that's the message we're trying to bring people. Attendees, which ranged from Capitol Hill staffers to lobbyists and legislators, were given shopping bags upon their arrival to browse the marketplace. They were encouraged to visit with the various vendors about their operations, as well as take home a sample of the products on display. Lotsey Spradling and her husband Mike own the Flying G Ranch in Oklahoma. They've been running polled Hereford cattle since 1932. But in 1986, after Lotsey and Mike got married, they began growing pecans. Spradling's ranch produced nearly a tenth of Oklahoma's pecan crop last year. Wow. Lotsey says there are just two things that consistently impact their family's operation. Mother Nature's the biggest. Um, probably politicians are the next biggest. Um, you have to be careful that you follow all the rules and regulations. If they shut down a market for us, China's been a big market for us. With the trade things going on, that market has definitely gone from being booming to a trickle. Part of the objective for the Marketplace event is to connect those producers and give them a face, as Van Hoos put it. Another goal is to give the producers a voice by sharing their thoughts and opinions with the folks who guide and create the legislation that impacts them. First of all, we appreciate the free market we have, but we also want to share our concerns about um, some of the tariffs both going both ways and also the group we're with, Farm Credit, um, has instrumental in keeping most of us afloat. The 116th Congress, which is currently on their August recess, is the most racially and ethnically diverse group the United States has ever seen. And as the urban sprawl continues, many in rural America have said they struggle to find the votes needed to elect leaders who are educated on the policy impacting their rural constituents. Mark Yeager and his daughter Anna have started making the transition over the past couple of years to give their business a face. They discovered more consumers wanting to interact with the people behind their products. We're telling a story of our cotton that we're growing, Jen and picking the best we got out of what we make and turning it into a, a textile that you can't buy anywhere in America, not where you know where the field it was grown in. The Jaegers have been farming cotton since the early 80s, but it wasn't until 2015 when Anna moved home full time after a stint in the Big Apple, they decided to cut out the middleman and market their cotton directly to consumers. I fought like crazy to not come back to the family farm, um, but my dad approached me in 2015 with this idea of taking the cotton that we're growing and making it into a consumable good that we could sell direct to consumer, and I thought that that had such huge potential. Redland Cotton, the business under which products from their Redland farms are sold, focuses primarily on textiles such as bedding and towels. Customer assessment of the product line, which includes a Made in America logo, have found the Jaegers selling their 100% cotton-based products at a premium. Over the past three-plus years, Anna has focused on sharing those values that Redland Farms brings into their textiles. She hopes that her fellow agriculturalists will someday be able to join forces to educate a wider swath of the public.
I'm personally hoping to go around and meet a bunch of other farmers that are creating products and, and seeing how we could work together even. Lodzi Spradling would agree that making the connection starts with one conversation at a time. We're face to face with another human being. They have to eat. We have to make a living. It really is a nice connection. Sometimes you just have to get your message out there. Well, next week we're headed to the Gulf. You think New Orleans, you think seafood, right? That's where you'll find this family, experts in aquaculture over the years in the shrimping business big time. In an industry that's competitive in every way, like land-based farmers, they are out early in the morning, bringing home the day's catch still competing against foreign companies still pursuing the American dream after half a century. Boris Gump will be proud we're in Nolens next time on Farm Week. And before we let you go, more gorgeous video from viewer Dennis Milligan. This one is of Winya Bay, Georgetown, South Carolina. A quaint historic town about an hour north of Charleston on US 17. Dennis's farm is about a half hour west. Great video, Dennis. Thanks for sending it in. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.